So you want steroid light gains, but you don't want to inject yourself or be stuck on steroids for life. Introducing SARS. After a few easy clicks of your mouse, you can have these liquid drops at your door and be on your way to becoming the next Chris Bumstead. Sound too good to be true? That's because it is. This week's question is, what are your thoughts on SARMs? Are some of them promising alternatives to anabolic steroids? And what are your biggest concerns with them? I could give the famous vigorous Steve quote and say, I don't have any thoughts on SARMs because I'm an actual athlete and I use real PEDs. And while I actually completely agree with him, I wanted to give the most in-depth answer that I possibly could. So over the past few weeks, I completely submerged myself in the literature, reading every study that I possibly could to understand their mechanism, their indications, and to tell you whether or not I think that you could benefit from them. I really wanted to arm you with any possible information you may need to make the decision on whether or not you should use these. So let's dive into this. So to start off this conversation, let's first talk about what a receptor and a ligand is. In this case, we're going to be talking about androgen receptors specifically, which are inside the cell. They fall into a class of receptors called nuclear receptors. So the ligand is anything that binds to that receptor. And in this case, we're going to be talking about androgens. So things like testosterone or DHT, or in this case, SARMs. So you have this ligand and you have this receptor and it's kind of like a lock and key situation. In order for it to actually work, the lock has to fit into the key and it has to be a perfect fit. So for simplicity's sake, if we have a round receptor and a square ligand, it won't fit. That round receptor needs a round ligand. So in order to make something selective for the androgen receptor, we need to make it so that it fits perfectly into only that receptor and no other receptors. So SARMs are gonna interact with a part of the receptor known as the ligand binding domain, which is just fancy term for saying the part of the receptor that the ligand or the hormone is going to bind to. When the ligand binds to the receptor, something called a conformational change occurs, which activates the gene. We'll get more into this a little bit later on, but where these SARMs come into play is that supposedly they're selective for only certain types of androgen receptors. Essentially meaning that hopefully these SARMs will only bind to androgen receptors in areas that we want an effect. So let's say muscle and bone. Where this could be super beneficial is in someone like, say, grandma. She needs to build some muscle, she needs to strengthen bones, but we don't want to turn her into a jacked out Arnold with a beard. We don't want to have those other androgenic effects. We simply want the SARM to activate the receptors on the muscles only, help her to build strong muscles. Now, of course, all you bros out there are thinking, yeah, that sounds awesome. We can only target the muscles and we're not going to have any issues with hair loss or prostate growth. And I would completely agree. That sounds really promising and worth looking into. But my concern with this is the selectivity. How do we make it so these only only bind to the muscle androgen receptors and no other androgen receptor. Well, these were kind of built off the backbone of the premise of CIRM, selective estrogen receptor modulators. These have been around for decades. They're used in things like fertility and cancer protocols, and even in men with hypogonadism trying to increase their levels of testosterone. The way these work is the exact same way. They're selective for only certain types of estrogen receptors, like estrogen receptors in the breast, for example, like raloxifene. It has a high affinity for estrogen receptors in the breast and in the bone and leaves estrogen receptors in other parts of the body alone. This makes it a a great tool for treating something like gynecomastia or breast cancer without having other estrogenic effects in other parts of the body. But the thing with estrogen receptors is we have two isoforms. We have an ER alpha and an ER beta. That makes it a lot easier to make drugs that either target the alpha or the beta isoform. But it's not as easy when it comes to the androgen receptor because as far as we know, there's only really one that interacts with ligands. Now there are two isoforms of androgen receptors. We have ARA and ARB. But the thing with A is it doesn't have that ligand binding domain, which makes it kind of interesting it's a receptor that doesn't have an area for a ligand, so how does it work? Well, that's for another discussion, but I think we can safely say that the SARM doesn't bind to that because there's no place for it to. So we're left with only one type of androgen receptor. So how is it that we can make the SARM only bind to certain androgen receptors when they're all the same? Well, this is where it seems like scientists are really banking on the fact that these SARMs don't get 5-alpha reduced. You see, there's certain tissues in our body, like the prostate, for example, where there's high levels of 5-alpha reductase and testosterone is readily 5-alpha reduced into DHT and DHT elicits more of an effect on those androgen receptors in the prostate. Researchers have found that when they give testosterone with finasteride, a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, the prostate doesn't seem to grow as much as it did when the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor like finasteride wasn't in there, leading them to believe that the testosterone doesn't really interact with the actual prostate receptors as much as it does other places in the body. So okay, that makes sense, but I still think that there's a possibility that the testosterone does interact to some extent, it just doesn't have as high of affinity for the androgen receptor as DHT does. But to say that it doesn't bind whatsoever, I, I just don't think that that's true. But another possibility that researchers have proposed is that they make these drugs selective for certain tissues. For example, these drugs will have a higher affinity for muscle tissue or bone tissue than, say, scalp or prostate. 
And that's a viable explanation, but I may be able to poke some holes in that later. And the only other explanation that I could think of is that they may interact with co-regulatory proteins in a different way than other androgens do. You see, these co-regulatory proteins are proteins that are kind of associated with the androgen receptor, and they, they help to elicit different responses to different drugs. Now, this is why something like primabolin will have a different effect on the androgen receptor than something like, I don't know, trembolone or testosterone. They're going to activate different co-regulatory proteins, and those are going to activate different changes downstream in transcription and translation. So that's a possibility too, and probably an area for further research. So as I just alluded to, after that ligand or the SARM binds to the androgen receptor, it sets off a cascade of something called transcription and translation. And briefly to touch on this, transcription is when we take DNA and turn that into RNA. It's basically like you're taking the recipes and you're putting into another recipe book. The recipe book is the RNA and that RNA gets turned into proteins. So when we have this transcription translation, what's happening, we're setting off this cascade of events where we're reading the recipe for how to build these proteins and then we're starting to actually build the proteins. It's kind of a complex mechanism, but I hope that you kind of get the gist. The androgen is gonna to bind to the receptor. It's going to basically read off the recipes of our DNA and it's going to turn that recipe into, I don't know, let's say a steak. It's gonna turn it into muscle or protein. So what do the clinical trials say about what SARMs do to skeletal muscle? Well, they seem to stimulate protein synthesis, they inhibit protein degradation, and they activate satellite cells. Now, these are all great things, and I'm sure you're thinking, hell yeah, I want every single one of those because I do too. And again, their application here is great, especially in populations like females or elderly who don't need the androgenic effects, you know, who don't need to grow beards or lose hair or have prostate growth, etc. This could help treat issues like osteopenia, or osteoporosis, sarcopenia, or cachexia. It could be a really promising treatment modality. Beyond even muscle growth, we could look at these as possible treatments for things like hypogonadism, for example. If you're not producing androgens, well, maybe we can just replace these androgens and have less of a negative effect in selective tissues. But the most important part of this discussion comes here. What are the risks? In my opinion, the biggest risk that we run is suppression. Suppression or shutdown of your endogenous hormone production. But wait a minute, if these are truly selective, you know, like selective from muscle and bone alone, how is it possible that they're going to shut down the HPTA? Because in order to shut down the HPTA, we'd either need to have some activation via the androgen receptors on the hypothalamus or the pituitary, or we would need estradiol levels to rise to a high enough level to activate those ER receptors on either hypothalamus or the pituitary. And we know that these don't aromatize into estrogen, so they shouldn't be increasing estrogen levels. So how is it that they're causing suppression? Well, the easiest explanation that I can come up with is simply that they're not that selective, that they actually are interacting with their hypothalamus and pituitary and causing that suppression. But let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that they are selective and try to come up with some ways that they may be suppressing us. So I've come up with a few here. The first one being intracellular signaling and feedback mechanism. So we know that these are interacting with androgen receptors. Is it a possibility that somehow interacting with peripheral androgen receptors sends a signal back to the hypothalamus and pituitary? I guess it could be possible. So what I'm saying here is say, you know, an androgen binds to the androgen receptor in the bicep. That activation of the androgen receptor somehow sends a signal to the hypothalamus of pituitary, which then leads to the negative feedback loop of suppressing production of androgens. That's a possibility, I guess, and it would be pretty interesting if we could come up with that because as of now, as far as I know, we don't know of any mechanisms where we bind to peripheral tissue and, you know, androgen receptors and cause a cascade of events that would lead to upstream suppression. Now, there's no data to support that theory, but I think it's an interesting interesting theory and worth exploring. The other theory would be that they actually promote super physiologic levels of testosterone. So how would this work? So we know that these SARMs don't get aromatized into estrogen. That would lead to lower levels of estradiol. And we know that the negative feedback loop of the hypothalamus and pituitary are sensing for lower levels of estradiol. When there's low levels of estradiol, that's when the system kicks on and we start producing more testosterone so that that can be aromatized and improve or increase the levels of estradiol. So what I'm saying here is since we have lower levels of that testosterone converting into estradiol, we have lower levels of estradiol, that may stimulate the hypothalamus and pituitary to start secreting both gonadotropin releasing hormones hormone and LH and FSH, leading to higher levels of testosterone. Those higher levels of testosterone would aromatize into higher levels of estradiol. That high level of estradiol would then interact with the hypothalamus and pituitary and suppress endogenous production of gonadotropin-releasing hormone and LH and FSH, and therefore shut down the production of testosterone. Now that's a mechanism that I can fully get behind and I think is the more likely culprit here. Now I know that these are sold in a way that says, hey, these aren't suppressive in any way. You can have your gains and remain natural and you're still gonna be producing optimal levels of testosterone. But that is not what I see in clinical practice. I almost always see guys come in significantly suppressed when they get labs on SARMs. 
It's just the way that it is. Now, some people will say that some SARMs are more suppressive than others. For example, they say that S4 doesn't cause any suppression. Well, I can tell you that I've definitely seen S4 cause suppression. Now, why is that? Well, we don't really know the mechanism behind it. One possibility would be maybe you're not getting S4 when you think you are. That's always the risk that we run when we're doing these underground compounds or buying things from sketchy research chemical companies. All that to say, I definitely see suppression of the HPTA almost every time I've ever seen a guy on SOMS. So don't take that part lightly. Other things we see in clinical practice are lipid skewing, like increases in LDLC or ApoB containing particles and decreases in HDLC. Now that usually is the exact opposite of what you want. Most people want higher levels of HDLC and lower levels of LDLC. I've almost never seen somebody on SARMs not have some extent of lipid skewing. And the other thing that I almost always see is transaminitis or elevated liver enzymes. Our liver cells contain these enzymes called ALT and AST. You may have seen them on your lab work and you may have been told your liver enzymes are a little bit high. That's what we're looking for. Essentially, liver cells contain these enzymes, and when these liver cells are either stressed or if they die off, they produce or release a lot of these enzymes. So when these enzymes are at higher levels in our blood, we know that the liver cells are either under some stress or are actively dying off and releasing these enzymes. Higher levels of these is called transaminitis. Now I can tell you that when I see people on SARMs, their liver enzymes are extremely high. Sometimes we're talking three, four, even five times higher than where they should be. Compare that to something with Anivar, you know, an actual anabolic steroid. Maybe sometimes I'll see their liver enzymes elevated 10, 15 points. But with this arm, I'm seeing them literally five times higher than they should be. Now, in my opinion, that's definitely cause for concern. So back to the question here, which is you know, what is my opinion on SARMs? What is my final verdict? Again, I think this is a very interesting and very promising concept. If we could truly figure out how to make these actually selective for only certain tissues in the body, it would greatly benefit certain populations that don't need the androgenic side effects of androgens. If we could help grandma just grow some muscle and bone in her elderly age without having to, you know, grow a beard or have some clitoral growth, kind of weird to think of grandma having clitoral growth, that would be massively beneficial for her. I just don't think we're there yet. But if you're listening to this, it's probably just because you want to be jacked. You don't really care about strong bones. But guess what? We actually have amazing drugs drugs for getting jet. They're called anabolic androgenic steroids. We have literally decades of data on them. We fully understand their mechanisms and their safety profiles. But what's the biggest downside of anabolic androgenic steroids? For most of us, it's that they cause suppression of our endogenous hormones. But we just discussed how SARMs do too. So in my opinion, if you're gonna suppress yourself, if you're gonna cause lipid skewing, if you're gonna cause elevated liver enzymes, why wouldn't you do it with a bioidentical hormone, meaning a hormone that your body already naturally produces that we have literally over 100 years of research on? But if you insist on doing SARMs, which at this point I highly recommend against, then here's what I would suggest. definitely get labs before, during, and after, maybe a month or two after. That way you can know what your baseline was, how the SARMs were actually impacting your health, and how they impacted your health after being off. I also think it would be a good idea to add in a SERM like enclomiphene. Now remember earlier I discussed SERM, selective estrogen receptor modulators. The way that enclomiphene in particular works is binding to those estrogen receptors in the hypothalamus and pituitary, kind of tricking those areas into thinking that your estrogen levels are low, and artificially ramping up LH and FSH production, leading to higher levels of testosterone. The hope here is that you're able to offset any suppression. You're kind of stimulating production while you may be getting suppression from the SARM. That way, hopefully you keep producing testosterone while being on the SARM and you get just the benefits without that nasty suppression that we see. I would personally rather just run them at the same time so that you never actually get shut down rather than just like running the SARM first and doing a post cycle therapy after. That's a possibility too. But again, if we could just offset ever suppressing you so that you don't have to do this post cycle therapy and you could just maybe come off both at the same time, I think that would be a far superior protocol. I would also try to do things to mediate your lipid skewing. That could be just diet modification, reducing saturated fats, increasing fiber intake. Could be supplements like citrus bergamot, natokinase, or you could consider adding in medications like azetamide, which is one of my favorite lipid lowering agents. And I would definitely, definitely run a liver protective protocol. You could run supplements like Tudka, N-acetylcysteine, and even glutathione. But again, I can't really harp on this enough that I simply don't think that we're at the point where we have a SARM that works as it's intended to, you know, specifically in muscle to get you jacked without having any of the negative ramifications of androgens. But we do have really potent drugs, anabolic androgenic steroids that work very, very well that we fully understand. So your choice here is take something that has very little data on it that we don't fully understand that seems to be that it doesn't really work. Or you could take something that we absolutely know works that we have decades of data on and that seemed to be significantly safer. Seems like an easy choice to me. Also, I mean, just 
just think about it. When was the last time that you saw a Sarm Goblin that was actually jacked and impressive? I'm talking one of those broccoli top, dangle earring, pajama wearing, croc wearing dudes at the gym who's only taking liquid drops and not pinning anything. They don't exist. They're not impressive. The C bombs or the Nick Walkers or the Derek Lunchfords of the world are pinning shit because they know that that stuff works. You never hear any of these pros come out with their cycles saying that they ran a SARMs only cycle in their off season or in their cutting season. And these guys are not afraid of side effects. They'll literally do anything. They fully accept the fact that they are slowly or sometimes even quickly killing themselves. What does that tell you? It tells me that they don't actually work as well as the anabolic steroids. Now I'm not telling you go out and pin anabolic steroids. What I am telling you though is if you're down to a choice between am I going to start pinning or am I going to start taking some weird drops off the internet, I actually think the earlier one is a safer one. I highly doubt someone impressive like Sam Sulik is pounding SARMs. I made an entire steroid cycle and ancillary stack for him in this video here, so watch that now.